I pick blueberries <laughs> and then I go and hang out at the book mill the for, oh, for lunch. Yeah. What a great day. A great day. Well, uh, as people file in, uh, we can at least start our intro. So welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, logging on and attending this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am a programming librarian here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, uh, please let me know in the chat if there's any technical issues and I can try to resolve them for you. Uh, if you have any questions or comments for our speaker, please use the Q&A uh, button and we will address them at the end. Uh, and if you do not wanna see chat previews uh, while the program's going on, there's a arrow next to the chat button uh, that has a menu and you should be able to select hide chat previews there. Um, I'd like to thank uh, generous donors to Cary Library Foundation for helping make tonight's program possible and Lexington Living Landscapes who organized tonight's event. Uh, tonight is part of an ongoing series of partner, uh, ongoing series of presentations where the library is partnering with Lexington Living Landscapes uh, to bring experts in landscape and conservation issues to the public. So now please welcome Charlie Wyman. Great. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening and welcome. We're delighted to have you with us and you're in for a treat this evening. I'm Charlie Wyman with Lexington Living Landscapes. And before I turn the floor over to Nick, let me say a, a word about us for any of you not familiar with us. We're a local volunteer nonprofit initiative launched in 20 to promote more sustainable landscaping practices in town. More native plants, fewer invasives, fewer chemicals, more trees. We grew out of a collaboration between the town's Sustainable Lexington Committee and three nonprofits, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, Lexington Climate Action Network, and Citizens for Lexington Conservation. You can learn more about us, including how to sign up for our newsletter at our website, www.lexingtonlivinglandscapes.org. Our great thanks to Nick for uh, joining us this evening and sharing his wisdom with us. And thank you as always to Matt and our Cary Library for hosting this evening's program. After Nick's presentation, we'll have a Q&A session moderated by Sarah Bothwell Allen, another member of our Living Landscapes team. If you have questions, uh, as Matt said, please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. We won't be monitoring the chat, but put them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Let me now introduce our speaker in out of the way. Nick Dorian is an ecologist, an educator, and a naturalist. He is a PhD student at Tufts University where he studies the population ecology of solitary bees and runs the Tufts Pollinator Initiative an urban pollinator conservation and community outreach group. Nick, thank you for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Charlie, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nick. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm a PhD student at Tufts. Um, I study solitary bees, and I'm really, really excited to welcome you to their, their secret world. Um, the world that exists right under our eyes, that's all over the city. And I hope to, um, you know, invigorate your appreciation for, for these charismatic insects. Um, before I get going, I just wanted to make a plug for the group that I run, the Tufts Pollinator Initiative. Um, we're a community-based outreach group bringing the science of pollinators to you and helping to build capacity for pollinator conservation in the greater Boston area. You can find us at Pollinate Tufts uh, on Instagram, or reach out to us, um, tuftspollinators at gmail.com. So when I, when I talk about pollinators, um, I talk about insects or animals um, that uh, facilitate plant reproduction. And these, these, these animals are important because 90% of flowering plants around the world require an animal pollinator. And 75% of our top global crops, everything from blueberries to coffee, to pumpkin, apples, to watermelon, require pollination. Most of our nutritious, uh, foods come from animal pollinated crops. And so we're all on the same page. When I mean pollination, I mean the, the transfer of pollen from the male part of the flower, which are the anthers, to the female part of the flower, which is the stem. Um, and plants have the problem that they can't move. And so how do they find a mate? Well, they, they recruit an animal to play matchmaker. They recruit an animal with petals that are showy. They recruit an animal with fragrance which smells good. They recruit an animal with nectar, which is food. Um, and in return, bees um, and other animals will move pollen from the anthers to the stigmas among flowers, and that facilitates reproduction. Importantly, I just wanna make 
thing is clear, bees are not trying to pollinate. They don't have the plant's best interest in mind. Pollination is an accidental process as bees visit flowers and drink nectar. Um, but as a result, um, uh, bees are some of our most important pollinators around the world, both in wild and uh, cultivated systems. And when we think of bees, I think most of us think of, of these guys, the honeybees. Actually, I should say these ladies. Um, the, these are the European honeybees, Apis mellifera. They live in big hives with tens of thousands of workers, all of which are female. Those workers are produced by a queen. She does all the egg laying, and she can live anywhere from two, three, four years. Uh, laying up to a thousand eggs a day. Um, these worker bees have a variety of tasks. They go out to collect pollen and nectar on flowers. They fan the hive to keep it cool. They guard the hive from intruders and they nurse and feed the developing larvae. Um, and these honeybees are really important for the agricultural system that we've created. Um, we can raise honeybees in boxes. We can ship them to farms. And recently concerns over the viability of honeybee stocks um, in the U.S. have prompted a lot of people to worry uh, about declines of honeybees. You know, artists, but also celebrities like Morgan Freeman and Angelina Jolie have raised concerns over the plight of the honeybee. But I want to make clear that honeybees don't need saving. Honeybees are best thought of as an agricultural commodity akin to backyard chickens. And so it's kind of ridiculous if I were to say, well, let's save songbirds by raising more chickens. The same could be said for let's let's save wild bees, let's save our native bees by raising more honeybees. Um, these data also suggest that honeybee colonies are actually fairly constant uh, in production in the US, even if winter mortalities go up. So the question is not, are honeybees going to go extinct or not, because they're not going to go extinct. But it's an economic question. How much money do we need to spend to make sure that we have enough honeybees for the way we've built our agricultural system? The environmental question, the conservation question, actually pertains to the non-honeybee, wild bees. The more than 4,000 species of bees that live in the United States that come in every size, shape, and color you can imagine. Green bees, blue bees, red bees, bees bigger than rigatoni, bees smaller. than thing just the way the flower fly. These are the bees we need to worry about. And unfortunately, in recent years, they've suffered real and sharp population declines. Take the rusty patch bumblebee example, Bombus affinis. In the 1990s, this was, bee was one of the most common cranberry pollinators in New England. By the year 2005, the last rusty patch bumblebee was spotted in Massachusetts. Uh, in 2009, the last sighting was on Cape Cod, and it hasn't been seen in New England since. Now it can be found on isolated mountaintops in West Virginia and a few cities in the Midwest. This is a startling decline that is not limited to the rusty patch bumblebee, but a sister species, Bombus tula, which also used to be abundant on Cape and the islands, is now uh, restricted to mountaintops in Western Mass and seems to be following a similar pattern. These declines are worrying because they happen quite quickly to relatively uh, widespread insects. I don't want this talk to be all about doom and gloom, though. And data from Vermont suggests that while some species, like Bombus affinis, the rusty patch bumblebee, and Bombus terricola, the yellow banded bumblebee, are declining, about half of bees with blue dots next to them are actually increasing in abundance. And so there's winners and losers in a changing landscape, in a human dominated landscape. And my job as a scientist is about sort of why is that happening. We have a good sense that some of the major threats to bees include pollution, uh, climate change, more intense heat waves, the widespread um, balance of agriculture, uh, com commercial agriculture and lawns, which reduces habitat, pesticides like toxic neonicotinoids, other habitat loss um, through the development of housing, of housing and, and invasive species, both plants and exotic bees. It's not any one of these threats that poses the greatest issues. It's, it's actually the synergy between all of these. For example, fewer, fewer flowers for bees combined with pesticides is more lethal than either than fewer flowers or pesticides. One thing that I think makes interpreting all of these threats difficult 
is that bees have a big secret, which is that we don't really know how they live. We, it's really easy to observe bees on flowers, and I'm sure many of you have done it. It's much harder to observe bees at the nest or underground or when they're not conspicuous. And so as a result, we have, as scientists, we have some data that tells us you know, where bees occur on flowers, but a lot of data about through the, through the bee life cycle is actually missing. And so I like to think that in order to save the native bees, we need to know the native bees. And if many of you in this, in this talk are interested in, in providing habitat for bees in your yard, and I, I'll be talking about that towards the end, um, I think it's really important that we know how these bees live so that we can make decisions about how we manage our landscapes for them. I think the most logical place to start in knowing our native bee neighbors is asking, what is a bee? Many of you may have seen insects like this on your flowers, but this is not a bee. This is a fly, a drone fly, in fact, a, a bee imposter, which is a pollinator. Uh, in its own right, it's on a flower. You can see the yellow grains of pollen on its leg. But note how it has just one wing on each side, that the wings are held out in a triangle. It has huge eyes that bulge into each other, and its antennae are short and club-like. Maybe some of you have seen bees at your picnic. These are also not bees. These are yellow jacket wasps, the bees that we see uh, that bother us during our 4th of July and Labor Day picnics. Bees are vegetarians and they would never be caught dead on uh, a piece of meat. Bees, if you're looking at them in the wild, have four wings, two on each side. They have long antennae and they're often very fuzzy. And this fuzziness is not just for warmth, it's also to carry uh, pollen more effectively. And this belies one of the most distinguishing features of a bee and is the basis for my definition, definition, which is that bees are vegetarian wasps, or you could call vegan wasps. So 130 million years ago, flowers were a novel on planet Earth. Um, and some of the first exploiters of flowers were actually not bees, but insects called thrips. And they thrips sort of like eating chewy flower parts, and thick petals or, or thick anthers. Um, but th and thrips are insects, protein-rich insects, in fact. And there are wasps called thrips hunting wasps. And these thrip hunting wasps were a relatively small group of about 20 species. And from this group of 20 wasps radiated 20,000 species of bees. Now, how, how did this happen? Well, if you could imagine that a mobile source, of, a protein source can move or leave, such as an insect that's, that can, that's motile, is a far less appealing source of protein than pollen, which is also protein rich and can't move. And so from this small group of wasps radiated this enormous diversity of bees, exploiting every single habitat on terrestrial earth where, where flowers occur. Um, to exploit the niche of, of protein-rich pollen. These aren't like wasps, actually are wasps, wasps that are adapted for a completely uh, vegan. And as a result, because bees are completely made out of pollen and nectar, every bee you see is made out of flowers. And more than that, every bee you see is made out of flowers that were there one year ago. And so it's sort of, they provide this memory of the landscape. And if you're seeing bees this year, you know that the landscape last year had flowers, um, and that the bees last year were able to find flowers. Um, bees are in this intricate relationship with flowers, and as such, some uh, hairs on their body have evolved to uh, carry pollen more effectively. So everywhere on a bee's body, you're going to find at least one hair that branching, branching as a way of increasing the surface area of that hair. And so hairs on wasps, they're all simple, just a single strand, but hairs on bees are branched, and this allows them to carry pollen back to the nest more effectively. So in order to know our native bees, we've defined what a bee is. What do bees do? I like to think that they do three things throughout their life cycles. Females build nests, they visit flowers for food, and then they spend a good deal of the year hibernating or developing inside that nest. One of our best known native bees is the bumblebee. And I'm sure many of you have seen them on flowers. Even if you didn't intend to go watch bees, sometimes you could be at a, a dinner and there's some 
you know, zinnias cut on your table and a bumblebee might come by to investigate. Um, they have an annual life cycle and they build colonies in a similar way to honeybees. So in spring, a queen emerges to start a nest. She finds a cozy place under the ground, such as an old burrow, to build her nest. She collects pollen and nectar to raise her first cohort of daughters. And then those daughters are all workers and they spend the summer gathering pollen and nectar to raise the, the eggs that the queen lays in the nest. In late summer and fall, when the colony is big enough, they switch from producing workers to producing males and new queens. Those males and new queens mate, the old queen dies, the old workers die, the old males die, and those new mated queens tuck away in a new location under leaves or in a compost pile for the winter and emerge to complete the cycle. So this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, in spring, we have these large queens. They are unmistakable and unmissable because you hear them a mile before they, you see them. These queens are, are large, um, large insects and they rely on spring shrubs and trees such as this red bud or high bush blueberry for that pollen and nectar. The workers throughout the summer depend on different plants, roses, clovers, bee balm, um, even things like tomatoes in your garden. Um, bumblebees have a generalist flower preference, so they have lots of different kinds of flowers. Um, and so some things that they love are cherries, roses, spirea, you know, clovers and indigo, bee balm and mountain mint. And one feature of bumblebees that uh, sets them apart from about half of our bee species, that they're capable of doing this thing called buzz pollination. Tomatoes, blueberries, cranberries, they keep their pollen under lock and key. And in order to release that pollen, they need to be sonicated at just the right frequency. Now, bumblebees are capable of doing this and you can actually hear it um, if you have to um, a, a tomato flower in summer. Watch for a bumblebee to fly close to that flower and listen as the frequency of buzzing becomes higher pitch and more staccato. Um, this is the bumblebee's attempt at releasing some of that pollen to carry back to the nest. In fall, bumblebees rely on different flowers. These drifts of goldenrods and asters sustain our bumblebees during, uh, as the days become shorter. And you can actually find male bumblebees sleeping on the goldenrod flowers um, on cold fall mornings. Males in the insect don't help around the house. And so the, as soon as they're produced, they get kicked out. Um, and as a result, they have to spend their days looking for new queens to mate with, um, on flowers and sleeping on those flowers. So from this, the way we support these bumblebees is we think about what they need throughout their life cycle. They need safe spots to nest, so undisturbed sort of edges of rock walls. Um, they need flowers for food throughout the year. So they need spur blooming trees like red maples or service berries or red buds or blueberries. They need flowers in the summer like our roses and our bee balm. They need flowers in the fall to support that next life stage, the asters and the goldenrods. And then they need a place to hibernate, an undisturbed leaf pile um, or a compost pile that a queen can spend a full seven months undisturbed. Bone bees are some of our most charismatic and well-known pollinators, uh, native bees, but native bees live in many different kinds of societies. So by far, actually, social bees are the minority. Uh, of, of our bees, and most of them actually live a solitary lifestyle. And by solitary, I'm meaning that each female builds her own nest. She doesn't live in a hive, she doesn't, she's her own queen, but she doesn't have a queen, and she doesn't make any hunt as a result. Um, and so she builds her own nest, does all of the tasks inside. And this is about 70% of our natives are solitary. The vast majority of solitary bees live below ground, and a bee that I've gotten to know quite well for my dissertation has been the cellophane bee, uh, Calides. Calides have one generation per year, and it's actually quite short. It starts in spring when they nest. Development in the nest happens over the summer. In fall, they pupate, just like a caterpillar, uh, a chrysalis. Bees spin cocoons, too and they pupate from a larva into an adult with wings. They spend the winter in the nest underground, out of sight. And then the following spring, stars bloom again, they emerge. 
After a long winter, I am anxious to get out to see bees, and so I'll bike down to the Mystic Lakes in Winchester. This is Shannon Beach. Here's a picnic area that is a place that people love to, to spend summer days. It's also a favorite spot for cellophane bees to build their nests. So this is one day uh, last year before the cellophane bees emerged. The following day I came down, it's about 55 degrees out, and I found this adorable male resting on an oak leaf. Males in cellophane bees emerge first, like in many solitary bees, and males are eager, so they, they're out waiting for the females to emerge. Remember, one of their only tasks in life is to find a suitable mate, because they don't help around the house. These cellophane bees are so energetic, and they're fueled by the sun's rays. Um, now, cellophane bees will often nest in close proximity to one another. Even though they're solitary, any nests will occur in aggregate. And here's a video that I want to show you of sort of the chaos that ensues on a warm spring day. So every little black dot is a male bee. And they're hovering over those sort of pale, what look like anthills. Those are actually bee nests, excavated sand that females have, have, have excavated. And the males are looking for females that are out of their nest and could potentially be suitable mates. I'm going to play it one more time because it's just so fun to watch. I just love that. To me, that is, there's, there's only about a week and a half every year that you can witness that. It's the first warm day in March, about days later is the activity period of male cellophane bees. After that, all of the females have mated and the females want nothing to do with the males after that. And so they kick them away. And as a result of this sort of cloud of aggregation of bees, robins and mockingbirds come from all over to pick off individual male bees from the periphery that are not paying attention. And it just, this, it goes from this silent hillside to the next day, it's just this flurry of activity. And even though it's a month and a half before warblers return from Central America uh, on their spring migration, it is just heralding spring. And you, you can't not um, feel that spring is on its way. So cellophane bees are one of our first emerging bees in spring. Um, and I think a really great bee for you to get um, introduced to the world of, of cellophane bees and this native bees. After they mate, the females get to work. They dig these long tunnels underground to excavate their nests. They guard their nests. They sun themselves in the entrance because again, it's, it's cold, it's March. Um, and they fly into trees to, to gather food. Um, as I mentioned, they live in these neighborhoods. So even though they're solitary, many individual nests will occur in close, close proximity to one another. And so the question then arises, well, how does a female bee remember her nest? Bees are exceptionally good at navigating, uh, and they also mark their, their nests with unique pheromones. So she remembers her nest both by sight, um, what were the unique features? Did I nest next to a, a broken bottle? Did I build it next to a stick and some leaves? But also by scent, um, her nest smells differently than her neighbors. As she departs her nest, she'll depart expanding zigzag lines, remembering greater and greater um, diameters of, uh, or, or circles of, of landmarks until she's satisfied she remembers her, her home environment well enough. She'll fly up into the canopy, into the red maples that border the Mystic Lakes, and she'll gather red maple pollen and drink the red maple nectar. You can see here, on her body that there's pollen dusted all over her face, all over her, her thorax, all over her abdomen. And there's also a concentration, a dense pack of pollen in her legs. This highlights the difference between pollination and pollen eating. So all of the bees uh, pollen that she's going to give to her babies are, is packed into her leg. On her leg, she has long specialized hairs for carrying dense packs of pollen, almost like a grocery bag, right? She's able to pack all that pollen in there. The pollen on her body is actually pollen that she's not going to consume or feed to her babies. That's pollen that's available to pollinate. 
So as she visits from flower to flower, the pollen in her legs, not really available for pollination, the pollen on her face, on her, on her antennae, on her, on her thorax, that's what's gonna get deposited on the stigma and, and be, uh, you know, contribute to pollination. So she turns underground to a prepared chamber that she built the night before. It's called a brood cell. And this is where one baby bee is going to spend all of its life. She's going to regurgitate nectar, scrape pollen off of her scopal hairs, and pack it into sort of a nutritious soup uh, or like very thin dough. Um, it's called bee bread or bee soup. And uh, she's going to create this soup uh, successive trips to the flowers. She'll make three, four, five visits during the morning. When she's gathered enough food for an egg, she's going to hang an egg from the top of the cell and then she's going to seal it. She's fashioned this cell out of her own saliva, and as a result, it is waterproof, it is antimicrobial, and it is the perfect co-nursery for her babies to spend the next 11 months. Now, I've painted this very rosy picture of the aggregation, except for the fact of the mockingbirds and the robins. There's also another predator that lurks, the blister beetle. The blister beetle is a flightless beetle that does not eat as an adult, and its sole goal is to mate and then lay eggs that will end up inside of a cellophane bee nest. The blister beetle female lays eggs in the sand that hatch into little mobile larvae called triangulin. The triangulin are exceptionally good at finding their way onto the backs of male cellophane bees. The male cellophane bees, when mate with the female cellophane bees, incidentally transfer some of those beetle larvae onto the female. As the female goes back and forth from flowers to her nest, she accidentally lets off those hitchhikers inside of the brood cell. The beetle larvae kill the host bee egg. They kill each other until just one remains. And inside of that cell, a blister beetle emerges the following year, not a bee. Talk about like a game of chance that this beetle plays, but it's a remarkable example of the coevolution between bees and their, their parasites. And we love blister beetles. Like it's easy to hate the blister beetle, but the only reason those blister beetles are there is because there's enough cellophane bees to support them. And this will be a theme um, throughout the talk is that these parasites and predators, even though they might be easy to malign, are actually um, all part of the reason why we support our native bees is for all those links that, they, that those bees help support between predators and parasites and flowers. By the end of April, we may, the cellophane bee aggregation is quiet again. People have finally come to the picnic tables to eat and little to the, they know that, that six to 12 inches beneath their feet are thousands of cellophane bees away too, eating lunch, that pollen soup that the female has packed underground. Um, and 90% of that bee's life will be spent out of sight underground. It will be the next 11 months that it develops into an adult and hibernates underground until the following spring. And I share this because it can't be, can't be out of mind. Earlier this year, the picnic area that is so beloved to me um, was an, underwent renovations. They were building a new swimming pavilion. Now I'm not here to say that the swimming pavilion is more important or it, the cellophane bees are more important than the swimming pavilion, but I doubt you that anybody involved in the swimming pavilion project knew that the cellophane bees were living there. And so so this is how you can be an advocate, because if you know that cellophane bee poplar are living in these areas, you can raise awareness for them and you can help people about them. And maybe there could have been consideration as to where the construction occurred. Cellophane bees are very resilient. And I checked again earlier this spring and luckily a large part of the population was still intact after the, the renovation was completed. Whew. I just talked about ground nesting. But other bees build their nests above ground in stems, or they excavate um, uh, pithy stems or hollow stems, or they build their nests out of, of pebbles glued together resin. Two of our most common above ground nesting bees are mason bees and leaf cutter bees, the genus Osmia and Megachile. Now, you may have heard of these bees because you've created a bee hotel for, for bees. Bee hotels, if you haven't heard, are basically um, collections of of vacant cavities that these bees can build their nests in. Um, I have a lot of opinions about bee hotels and I'm not gonna get into them right now. If you have questions about the merits of bee hotels and when and when not to use them, I'd be happy to take those afterwards. 
One of the I think is the coolest part about bee hills is that they bring the nesting lives of bees closer into view. Think of them like a bird box. Um, how cool is it to see Carolina wrens nesting in your backyard? How cool is it to see leafcutter bees carrying back little petals that, uh, and, and disks of leaves that she's from nearby plants uh, into her nest? True to the name, these bees build uh, nests out of different materials. Leafcutter bees build nests out of leaves. They, each of these leaves goes into fashioning a brood cell. Instead of using her saliva like the cellophane bees, she uses leaf matter. Resin bees build their nests out of tree sap that they collect, and mason bees build their nests out of mud. Bees don't have Ikea to go to, and so in order to build their nests, they have to find these materials in the environment. And so this is another reason that we have to consider when creating habitats for bees. What are the materials they need to build their nests? Is there a source of mud nearby? Are there suitable leaves for these bees to collect? I was walking to my advisor's house last summer, and I stumbled upon this red bud leaf with these conspicuous disks cut out from the edge. This is not a weird cultivar of red bud that's like a Swiss cheese variety. This is the work of a leaf cutter bee. She starts on the edge and takes her mandibles and cuts out a neat little disc that's just big enough under her abdomen, and she returns to her nest somewhere nearby. We could have seen this in action if we had had a, a bee hotel that we were uh, able to watch. But I encourage you to go out in your garden and play detective. Maybe you'll see these little discs cut out of the edge of your roses, and instead of thinking, oh, it's a pest on my rose, maybe you'll say, oh, it's actually a beneficial pollinator that roses have supported. Of course, it would not be a talk about bees without the parasites that they support. Cavity bees are also vulnerable to parasites. This is a leucospid wasp that has just the most remarkable way of finding, uh, of getting its, its eggs into the nests of bees. Rather than relying on hitchhikers, it takes a more direct approach. It's going to lay its eggs directly into the nest. So on the right side, we have a wasp. We have a long ovipositor egg laying organ coming out. We see that the egg laying organ bypasses this first cell that's being actively built by the bee into this back cell that's actually already been completed and contains an egg. And I want you to just see the magic trick that ensues. So here's wasp. Here's the ovipositor. And watch at the tip. And like an egg just came out of the tip of the ovipositor. Like this wasp was able to figure out where to place her ovipositor so that it was not in an actively cell. She was able to use that ovipositor to feel around for the appropriate distance inside of that cell, know that it had already been completed, and then manage to lay an egg all before the host bee got back. Because if that host bee got back, that host bee would have known something was up. And so talk about... Um, uh, a wasp that's finely tuned to a host. And I talk about how this is a sort of remarkable example. This is not at all uncommon. There are so many wasps and other insects that depend on the nests of bees to live. Um, and again, I think this is just a remarkable example of the interactions between organisms that you can witness in your own garden. Bees are another kind of above ground nesting bee, and there's two, they come in two flavors. We have the big carpenter bees that we all know, Xylocopa, and we also have the tinier blue carpenter bees, the Ceratina. Ceratina and Xylocopa, although they look wildly different, are united for their pinch for chewing wood. Uh, the carpenter bees excavate their nests out of wood. Ceratina will excavate pith from um, dead stems, um, such as those in raspberry canes. Um, or elderberry stems or sumac stems. And bigger carpenter bees will actually chew dead wood um, in, that are being snags in the forest. Or since humans arrive, they'll chew up your untreated deck wood. Um, and this actually causes a lot of problems. The carpenter bees galleries of nests um, that aren't, don't actually pose a, a threat, physical threat to people, but can do a lot of damage to expensive deck after it's installed. Um, so if you're not enchanted by carpenters and you don't really want them eating a back, 
I just encourage you to avoid chemical approaches um, rather than putting those chemicals in the environment. Um, you can discourage them by painting over the nest hole, by plugging the ends at night with um, caulk or steel wool. Um, and unfortunately, that will kill the bees inside. Um, but there isn't, unfortunately, a great way of discouraging them once they're established because their biology is to return to the same nest site over and over and over again. Happy to talk more about carpenter bees also at the end if you have questions. Okay, that was a whirlwind introduction to bee nesting. But bees also visit flowers, and this is where we get to see bees most often. As I mentioned, bees are vegetarians. They eat flowers, which, are, which provide nectar, carbohydrates, and pollen, which is protein. And bees actually, bees visit flowers in a very selective way. So one way that um, bees and flowers interact is they interact through tongue length and flower, flower depth. So long tongue bees, like this bumblebee on the left, um, visit flowers with deep corollas or deep tubes. On this Menard bee bomb, the nectar is way down here at the base and the bee's face is way out here at the entrance. So only a bee with a long tongue access the nectar deep inside the flowers. In contrast, this Hylaeus, this masked bee, um, actually uh, has a short tongue and can, could never drink nectar from that bee bomb. And so its favorite flowers are ones with very corollas. And so something to notice in your garden is, do I see particular bees on particular flowers? And does that have anything to do with what that flower looks like? So if I only watch the long flowers with long corollas, what sorts of bees visit those? Versus maybe Queen Anne's lace is an example of a flower with very short corollas. Of course, bees are hungry and they're not trying to be a flower's best friend. So when there is a lot of uh, nectar, bees will find ways around those, those constraints that flowers have imposed. This is a carpenter bee that has used its mandibles to slit a hole in the base uh, of a, a salvia flower and essentially bypass that long corolla and make the corolla shorter. And so this is called nectar robbing. And carpenter bees have strong mandibles because they're chewing up wool decks all the time. And so they can chew, they can bite those flowers. And as a result, they create a little slit that lots of other bees will come in and use. So carpenter bees are facilitators. Um, they're not a good pollinator of this salvia, but they, um, they find their way around it. And you can observe uh, little bruises and wounds on the base of tubular flowers in your garden, such as hostas or, or salvias like this or monarda, um, which are the result of bees trying to rob nectar. In addition to nectar, they also stock the pantry with protein-rich pollen. Pollen can be really, really protein-rich, which is why it's such a successful food resource for bees. Bees, flowers, are spend a lot of time, female bees at least, spend a lot of time collecting pollen and ensuring that pollen doesn't get lost. And they have a variety of ways of storing it for transport back to the nest. Leafcutter bees on the left store it dry underneath their abdomens on their butts. They have these long branched hairs that they use to pack pollen, that they use to collect pollen. Um, and you know it's a leafcutter bee, or at least in that taxonomic family, because all the females in that group store pollen underneath their abdomens. Other bees will store it dry on their legs, and they often look like they're covered in Cheeto dust. Like this bee is normally all black, and then all of a sudden it's just punctuated by this contrast of orange. Um, that's not hair color, that's pollen. And then a small group of bees, including the honeybees and bumblebees, store it wet on their legs. And this is the ultimate way of carrying pollen because it can, it's not ever going to be given up for pollination. This is known as a corbicula, and the bees mix the pollen with nectar to make a sticky little ball that they, that they pack onto their legs. And you can observe all of these features quite easily in summer um, by watching bees on in your garden. The you can ask yourself, where is the pollen? And almost certainly it's either gonna be underneath the abdomen, on the legs dry or on the legs in a pellet. Um, and just like not all nectar and not all bees visit the same flowers for nectar, um, not all bees visit the same flowers for pollen. About 30% of our native bees are incredibly picky eaters. These are called the specialists. There are sunflower and aster specialists, bees that only collect sunflower pollen. There are blueberry specialists, there are cranberry specialists, there are um, goldenrod and aster specialists. There's native tomatillo specialists. There are specialists on maleberry and specialists on holly. 
And the list goes on and on and on and on. And knowing the specialist relationships between bees and their host plants um, is important to making sure that we're providing resources for all of our bees. Just planting any old flower will go away to supporting common bumblebees that are not so picky. It won't go a very long way to supporting some of our specialist bees. One of those, one of those common flowers that actually does a great job is sunflowers. Sunflowers support a lot of generalist bees, but also support a pretty big diversity of our, of our picky eaters, especially in the sort of greater Boston area. Um, which is to say, if you plant it, oftentimes these specialists will show up. They're really, really good at finding their host plants. Um, one of my favorite specialists is the squash bee, Epinapis pronosa. Now, the astute listeners of you and you might be wondering, like, why the heck is this bee in Massachusetts? Squash is not native to the Northeast. In fact, it is it's not native to most of the United States. It's native to the desert Southwest, where wild squash grows along roadsides. Over the last several thousands of years, um, as native peoples have traded squash as a very important crop resource, native peoples grew it invariably every year. Um, and the squash bee um, genetic analyses show the squash bee was sort of domesticated in the process. And so now the squash bee, which formerly had a range in the Southwest US, can now be found from Massachusetts to Oregon because humans now invariably, unfailingly grow zucchinis, pumpkins, uh, squash every year. Um, if for one year we stopped growing squash, the squash bee could not reproduce because it's its only source of pollen. And so squash bees are here precisely because we plant squash. Their entire life cycle revolves around squash. Here is a, a pumpkin patch. And in the far foreground, you can see these sort of ant anthills. Again, not anthills. They are uh, the nests of squash bees. And early in the morning when the squash blooms open, the males are zooming for the flower uh, ricocheting, looking for females. The females, tired of the males' tomfoolery, sort of dodge them, collect pollen, and go back to their nest quickly. By noon, the squash flowers are depleted of pollen. The males, the females tuck away under their, in their nests, but the males are not welcome in that nest because remember, males don't help around the house. And so the males actually tuck away into the flowers. And one of my favorite ways of getting up close and personal with bees is to go out at like two o'clock in the afternoon to my zucchini plants and just peel open the massive flowers that have closed to the day. And inside you'll be face to face with uh, several squash bee males, July, early August. Um, and this is a totally safe activity because male bees can't sting. Females are the only bees that have stingers. So you can bring your kids out and you can show them this really cool glimpse into the world of native bees. And what's going to happen because of this really tight evolution between bees and wasps. Knowing that science, knowing that evolutionary history allows us to be really confident in the predictions we make. Of course, I could not tell the story without not acknowledging the predator. The life of the cuckoo bee that depends on the squash bee. I've mentioned other non-bees that parasitize bees, blister beetles. I've mentioned robins that eat adult bees. I've also mentioned wasps. But bees, there's a small group of bees, actually quite a substantial group of bees, called cuckoo bees. And their whole life cycle revolves around other bees. Female cuckoo bees do not build their own nests. Much like how cowbirds lay their nests in, in eggs inside the nests of songbirds, cuckoo bees lay their eggs inside nests of, of other bees. This is the squash, um, the squash longhorn cuckoo bee. Um, and doesn't it look so waspy, right? It has no hair. It's sort of black and yellow coloration. Um, it holds its dark wings out. Um, and it doesn't need to be very hairy because it has no pollen to collect. Its sole task is to slip inside of a nest while the female bee is out, lay an egg in a brood cell undetected, and then slip out. And when mama squash bee returns, she has no idea what just transpired. So here's a video taken by one of my colleagues. Checks one more time. He's off. Cuckoo bees do not dig their own nests. So that is the nest of the squash bee. That cuckoo bee has just spent some considerable time inside. 
um, anywhere from a few minutes to I've I've observed cuckoo bees spending 20, 25 minutes inside of the nest of another bee, looking for a brood cell to lay an egg in, laying that egg and then slipping out. Um, she is screwed if that host squash bee returns, and so she's got to be swift. Um, and inside uh, that sealed brood cell will now contain a host bee egg and a cuckoo bee egg. The cuckoo bee egg hatches very quickly and it hatches into a larva with huge jaws, ice, the squash bee egg in half. The cuckoo bee then is left to develop on the pollen. It eat the bee, it doesn't eat the egg, bees are vegetarians, right? So it just eats the pollen um, and it develops over the next 11 months into um, an adult cuckoo bee. And from that nest next year, we, your garden has just supported uh, not only squash bees, but cuckoo bees too. And I just want to recapitulate, right? Cuckoo bees are not bad. They actually make up 15 to 20% of regional bee diversity. And so, but what if I told you this whole story from the cuckoo bee's perspective? I could say how this cuckoo bee female had spent all morning looking for a suitable place to lay her eggs. He couldn't catch a break. The nectar was not easy to find. She had to fly so far to find that host bee nest. And when she finally did, she was able to slip inside and hopefully laid an egg that was stirred by the squash bee. So when we flip the narrative from the good squash bee to the good cuckoo bee, it's amazing how similar it is to the stories that were told on natural history shows of the lion that can't find a gazelle to hunt. Um, and I just encourage you to flip the narratives in your head if you think only bees are the good ones, uh, only, you know, host bees are the good ones. What if we told the story from the cuckoo bee's perspective? And there's a whole other tour I just um, revere the world of the cuckoo bee because it is quite marvelous how they're able to find their, their hosts uh, without fail and, and complete their life cycles. And if you find a cuckoo bee, consider it a treat. Consider it a treat that your yard is, is, supports a big enough bee population that cuckoo bees can find hosts and reproduce successfully. Cuckoo bees also are part of the ecosystem and they also feed spiders. And this is a cuckoo bee on a, a, a sunflower that has been predated by, uh, oh, by a crab spider. This is another amazing interaction you can witness. These are crab spiders that don't spin webs, but they sit and wait as ambush predators. And if you ever see a bee appearing quite motionless on a flower on like a hot day, and you're like, why is a bee sitting still? You should take a little bit closer look. There might have been an ambush predator that is having a meal uh, of that bee. So taking all of what we just learned into consideration, I wanna emphasize that you can make a difference. It might seem quite overwhelming that there's so much to learn about native bees. There's so many intricacies. Um, and I wanna give a few examples of, of the difference that you can make and the actions that you can take to help bees in your yard. So I'm gonna use the example of the gardens that I've created at, at Tufts University. Over the last four years, we've transformed what used to be a parking lot um, or warehouse and factory for decades. It was converted to artist's lofts and then Tufts decided to, to renovate the building as the student space um, and courtyard in 2015. By 2017, the courtyard was had been landscaped, but the landscaping wasn't being cared for. And I created a group called the Tufts Pollinator Initiative, and we wanted to attract both people and pollinators to landscape. We set up the garden with uh, dozens of native plants, and one year post-planting, our garden was just absolutely spectacular. Um, it was definitely a cherry-picked image of August, the peak bloom. Um, and you can see we have all sorts of diversity of flower colors and shapes. One of my favorite examples of the ability of this garden to support our native bees comes from the planting of ironweed, which is just in the front right here. Every year I pick a favorite native plant and I focus a lot of my observations on that plant. And a couple years ago, ironweed was that plant. I love ironweed. It's so, it just sends these huge sort of spikes up um, and waits until the very last days um, in, in August to, to, to burst into to purple brilliance. Um, and, and, and with it, there's these, these longhorn bees that have steely blue eyes um, and a sort of a white face that come and drink the nectar out of these flowers. The minute we planted these flowers, these bees showed up. I don't know where the near, next nearest patch of ironweed is, but it's not close. And ironweed, um, we planted ironweed and these bees arrived. 
The males were searching for mates on the flowers. Um, this is a male approaching a female on the flower. He has long antennae. He has big scopal hairs on her legs for collecting pollen. And soon after this happened, I, she kicked him away with her, her leg. Um, then the mated females gather that snow white pollen in their, their scopal hairs, and they return to nest somewhere else. For as many years as I've been watching these ironweed bees in our garden, I've still never have found one of their nests, um, despite my looking. And in fact, no scientists have ever located one of their nests. With careful looking, I think we, we can find where they nest and know what they need. But this is where observations of planting for particular insects and then going out and making observations can make a difference. The ironweed bee is just one of over 130 species of pollinators that use our tenth of an acre garden throughout their life cycles. Three years post planting, we added a bunch of other spaces, and I encourage you to come and visit our gardens on Boston Avenue. I've tried to take this photo so that it looks as much nature as possible, but you know, a few meters to your right, there's the new Green Line extension that comes by every five minutes or so. So dab in the middle of the city, and it's chock full of biodiversity. Um, and a lot of the programming we do is exposing people to the nature in their backyards. We entertain and educate and um, engage uh, hundreds of people each year on these pollinator safaris. And uh, for our mailing list, hopefully you'll be able to get on uh, the list for uh, one of our safaris later this summer. The principles that we use to save our native bees are simple. We use seeds, S-E-E-D-S. -E -E S stands for spread native flowers. It doesn't have to be a tenth of an acre. It doesn't even have to be uh, a front yard. It can be as small as a pot of flowers on a balcony, possibly sunflowers. Um, and a pollinator garden in this, in this conceptualization is just an area that's designated and designed and planted with the needs of the insect in mind. So if you're planting specifically to support a pollinator, then um, it's a pollinator garden. One of the main principles of pollinator gardening is that you prioritize a sequ sequence of blooms throughout the year. So in early spring, when not insects are active, there's not much blooming in our gardens. Um, spring blooming trees and shrubs take the stage in May. Uh, we have irises and we have this hawthorn that's blooming. Um, still, there's a lot of trees around the city like black cherry that are feeding our bees. In June, we have foxglove beard tongue, penstemon, we have some spirea that's blooming, um, and we have coreopsis that's now taking, taking center stage in our gardens this year. In July, um, more and more starts to flower. Uh, we have which pollinators appreciate a bulver's root, of joe pie weed, of bee balm. Um, notice how the trees are, are now leaves and there's no, no food in the trees to the bees anymore. In August, the garden is, is tall and robust and colorful. We have our ironweed, we have our cup, we have our cut leaf cone flowers and our golden rods beginning to signal the arrival of fall. In September, we have New England asters and golden rods taking us all the way to frost, supporting not only resident insects like bumblebees, but also migratory insects like monarch butterflies. In October, there's no pollinators left after frost, but the seed heads provide food for birds like migratory sparrows and goldfinches. And our vegetation provides cover for those insects to spend the winter like our bumblebee queens that need to have undisturbed to hibernate. If you're looking for places to get native plants, I'm sure this information is widely available. Um, some of the places that I've enjoyed getting plants from um, are on this slide. I've mentioned some of these names. Uh, these will be available afterwards, of course. Here are some of my picks for season-long blooms for bees. So Coryopsis, Beard Tongue, Wild Bergamot, Purple Coneflower, which supports one of my favorite bees, the bi-colored striped sweat bee. You can see it there. It's bright green with a black and white abdomen. Ironweed, as I've already talked about. Early Sunflower, and New England Aster, and Golden Rods. If you have a shady garden, such as many people do in um, New England, I have more recommendations for you, which are shade tolerant blooms for bees. Again, these are plants that bloom throughout the growing season. 
There are wild geranium specialist bees. There are golden Alexander bees that only visit golden Alexander. There are dogwood bees that are about to emerge. Black cohosh is an incredibly beautiful plant that blooms in the darkest depths of the July underbury. Lobelia feeds those late season bumblebees and cutleaf coneflower um, is, is just treat and the leaves are edible. Um, calico aster and goldenrod also carry us into fall with our, our, our goldenrod and aster specialists um, and our great shade tolerant plants. And I still have more for you because the list keeps going on. Uh, if you're thinking about planting for, for bees and you'd like to add something woody uh, to your, your yard, can't go wrong with red maple. There are dozens of willow specialists, red bud, tulip tree. Those flowers are just drop dead gorgeous. They're, they're, they're blooming right now. Uh, prunus, which are cherries. Aronia, which is choke cherry. Um, uh, Highbush blueberry. There's several blueberry specialists in the area. Meadows uh, and, and actually oaks. And I added oaks here because oaks um, get a lot of attention as host plants for, for moths and caterpillars. And yes, oaks don't provide nectar, but remarkably, bees still use oak pollen. Um, they visit these wind pollinated plants for oak pollen. And so uh, don't discount it. Just because it doesn't have nectar doesn't mean it doesn't have value for bees. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I am going to move on to my next um, letter. I can, I can talk all about gardening. There could be an hour of gardening talk. So the second, uh, the second letter in seeds is employing a life cycle approach. Um, and this means considering um, foraging. It also can mean considering nesting, and it means considering hibernation, the thing we talked about today. I recommend that people resist the urge to clean up their garden until May 1st. Um, the Xerces Society has a great um, program called Leave the Leaves. Just thinking about leaves not as something to discard, but something to encourage and something that builds uh, carbon in our soils and something that provides habitat uh, over the winter for our hibernating insects. Um, leaving the leaves doesn't mean leaving a mess, though. You can rake leaves off your lawns. Just don't like cut them with a lawnmower because that's going to cut the insects inside the leaves, too. You can spread the leaves in a two inch layer of your garden bed. You can place cut stems in a pile off to the side. And you can, um, uh, so you can clear off your yard if you'd like that to be, to be clear, but also make sure those leaves don't just get carted away or, or shredded um, if you want to provide habitat. The second E is really quite simple. It's like eliminate pesticides. Like what kills a mosquito invariably is bad for bees. Um, this, this includes uh, pesticides that are toxic, but also like herbicides that kill weeds, which reduce the amount of food available on the landscape for bees. Um, and fungicides. I mentioned how bees build those um, pollen and nectar soups in their nests. Those soups are chock full of beneficial fungi and bacteria, and fungicides reduce the availability of those microbes for bees as well. In seeds, D also includes discover what's around you. This is by far my favorite part of seeds, which is just going out and noticing the pollinators in your yard. Um, Mary Oliver has this just wonderful quote that anchors all of my work, which is that attention is the beginning of devotion. And when we begin to pay attention to the insects around us, we begin to feel something for insects that maybe instilled fear in us as a kid. For the first 20 years of my life, I was scared of bees. Um, I vividly remember like running the hills when a carpenter bee like approached. Now that carpenter bee was not out to get me. He was just defending his territory. Um, but I think about the last 10 years and the shift um, in my relationship with insects has been one of, of greater empathy um, and care for insects. And I attribute a lot of that to spending time, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours watching them and becoming familiar with their lives and their habits. You know, distance really breeds fear. It's really easy to be scared of a bee if you don't know its name, if you don't know what it does, if you think all bees sting. And proximity breeds empathy. So the closer we bring these insects into our lives, the more I think it's, it's easier to care about them. Um, and the more you'll wanna share with your neighbors all the cool things that you're finding in your yard. So some bees that you can spot right off the bat, well, cellophane bees are done for the year, but purple coneflowers are about to pop, um, and you should look for the bicolored striped sweat bee. It's race car green on its head and thorax and black and white on its abdomen. 
you cannot miss it. Um, purple coneflower is its favorite. And then common eastern bumblebees. They're around now and they'll be out until frost. Uh, goldenrods and asters are some of the best places to spot them, especially on a cool morning. Uh, the males have fuzzy little muscatches. Um, and if you come on one of our safaris, we'll certainly go on a bumblebee petting zoo and you can get up close and personal with these bees. I've been recently promoting this concept of bee watching. So if you're a bird watcher, um, I'm going to turn you on to bee watching. I've developed these materials with my good friend and, and colleague, Max McCarthy, who works down at Rutgers. At Rutgers. Um, I recommend you get a pair of these Papilio Pentax binoculars. They just are so amazing for bringing the micro into the macro. You look at them and you can focus on something just a foot away from you. Um, and it takes this whole micro world and brings it front and center. If you're curious more about identifying wild bees, I've written a website with Max called watchingbees.com. Um, and it has field guides uh, and identification marks. Uh, uh, for, for about 50 common bees in New England, most of the ones that you're going to see in your backyard. And the last S of seeds is sharing it with others. Now, to do this, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, it's going to take uh, a large um, effort, which I think Lexington Living Landscapes really embodies, um, uh, to share it with others and engage communities in this work. Um, so take what you've learned today and, and tell it to your neighbors. Um, you, know, you can be, be, a, be an advocate for the lives of native bees and encourage people to also welcome them into their lives. I'm gonna leave you with a very brief takeaway. Um, and it's um, in order to save our, our native bees, um, we, need to, we need to go outside and we need to watch bees. We need to introduce ourselves to our native bee neighbors. We need to pay attention to what they need because it's, really becomes quite easy to understand what they need when we pay attention to them and we observe their, their lifestyles. And when we do that, we learn that they don't require much um, and that our role would be to take small, intentional, and repeatable actions um, every year. Um, it could be planting their favorite flowers throughout the year in a garden or a pot on a balcony. It could be telling the pesticide company for like the eighth time, we're not interested in having you visit our property. We care about the bees. We want to encourage the bees. Uh, or it could be something like teaching a child that bees should be revered and not feared. And from a young age, instilling in them that respect for the, the non-human insect world. Um, and when we do that, um, we can, uh, it means each of us has the agency to, um, to build our forests and to keep our forests full of, of bees like Andrina erigenia, uh, to keep our old fields full of bees like Bombus fervidus, to keep our pine barrens full of Calides validus, to keep our meadows full of Andrina nubecula, to keep our headlands full of Haberpoda laboriosa, keep our wetlands full of Dufouria novianglia, to keep our dunes full of Calidiaculiferous, our gardens full of oh, my favorite, Agapos and Varesens, um, all of whom are our collaborators that can spark water and cultivate empathy for insects and help us grow a more livable future. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I know I went a little over. I'm happy to take um, any questions you have. Thanks so much. Hi again. Um, Nick, thank you so much for this delightful talk. I've really enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else listening has as well. Uh, and first, I just want to say thanks for the seeds framework. I think that's really helpful because it's not just about getting those plants in the ground in the spring, but it's really things that you can be doing even in the middle of winter, the sharing part. Thank you so much for, for sharing a framework that gives us things that we can just be thinking about and engaging with all the time. Um, I think I see a few questions that were um, related to the cellophane, cellophane um, bee dirt tiles and um, how can you tell apart from ant nests? And I think there's a few maybe related questions. So maybe start with that one. Yeah, the best way is just the diameter of the entrance. So an ant nest is going to have a diameter of about a pinprick, like the hole is gonna be about the width of a pin. Uh, and the bee's nest is going to be about the diameter of a pencil. 
So you imagine just like a number two pencil, it's sort of wide and thick and Aunt Ness is maybe, you know, a bobby pin width or a pin or, or you know, a piece of spaghetti, much, much smaller. Yeah, you can think about an ant just being big enough for an ant carrying a pupa to fit down and not much bigger than that. They yeah. don't make them extra, extra wide. Um, that's helpful, thanks. So I guess um, a sort of related question about, um, about, um these nests in the ground i think a lot of people maybe are are going to be surprised about how many ground nesting bees there are that you described and also may have had the experience of their their kids running across a lawn and and getting a surprise sting and not seeing where it's coming from it just out of the ground and i was wondering if you have um any advice for people at their homes on how to sort of balance um providing this habitat and, and rejoicing in, in the discovery of these nests, but also um, trying to minimize these unfortunate encounters with singing. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm i happy to talk about that. So I think some of our most unfortunate encounters actually come from ground nesting social wasps. Uh, yellow jackets are pretty apt to nest in people's lawns. They become quite active uh, when people wanna spend time outside, like late July and August. Um, and I think most of the encounters that people have with ground nesting bees are actually social wasps. Um, the solitary bees, I'm not sure I emphasized enough, are like incredibly docile. Um, if you're concerned about sort of like the flurry of activity, um, I think one of the best things you can do is, is, is use it as a learning opportunity because they're so gentle, like getting up and close and seeing that they don't sting um, is an awesome way of sort of um, sort of removing some of that fear. Um, there's a school that I a school project that I, I heard where they instead of calling them cellophane bees, they tickle bees and they encourage them to go out and like have them walk on their hands. Um, often the most intimidating part of cell, of ground nesting bees is the activity of males. You're like, oh my gosh, there's like thousands. Of Important to remember that, that none of them could actually sting. Um, and in the bee that I was heard of when I was younger, this male carpenter bee, A, can't sting, and B, was just sort of like chasing me away from his territory. Um, in the case of the yellow jackets, um, I think it can actually be a, a real problem, especially if it's a place where you spend a lot of time. And I'm, I'm never one for killing insects, um, but I'm also not going to say that you should just you know, give over your whole yard to this this nest of yellow jackets. And that's one I wouldn't suggest getting up close trying to do a lot of focused observation. I think yellow jackets can be quite aggressive, especially when you invading their nest space. One of the things that makes our solitary bees pretty docile is that they're solitary and she is her only, she's a member of her nest. And so if she's trying to be aggressive, that potentially jeopardizes her whole legacy, her whole, her whole offspring. Um, whereas if a, a guard wasp dies, well, there's hundreds of other sisters that are there to, to continue the nest. And so I would have a, sort of a trained exterminator come in, request that they don't use chemicals um, to get rid of it um, and deal with it that way if it's really a problem. Thanks. I'm glad you really distinguished um, some of the behavior among um, especially these solitary bees and, um, and these strategies. Um, that sort of leads us to this one person's question about who do be female bees use their stings on mostly if they're um, not using them much? Yeah, um, they'll, so you can imagine this, like a, it's not going to be very effective. It's not going to, they're not going to use it on people very much. They're not going to really use it. Use it like try to get a robin when the robin snags one. Um, they're mostly going to use it to defend themselves against sort of insect predators. So some insects hunt adult bees. One of them is a robber fly. There are robber flies that snatch adult bees out of midair. They're very good mimics often. Um, and so a robber fly is a bit more appropriately sized for a bee to sting and get away. Um, and also things like there's wasps called bee wolves that, um, that hunt bees. And so a bee might use her stinger there. And importantly, a, a bee stinger is never to kill the bee stinger is always to startle, to give her that extra second to get away. Um, and that's what the solitary bee would do if it ever to sting a person. It would never to be to like attack or be aggressive. It would be, oh my goodness, I'm threatened, I need to escape. And it gives you just that one split second to get away. 
Thanks, Nick. Um, you have a question about the bee houses. And as you were talking, I was thinking about how similar um, B or bee hotels rather are to um, like when the robins build a nest right outside on the porch and you can watch them. You were saying fun it is to have that front row seat to what they're doing. Um, what's the downside of, of bee hotels? Okay, so let's we can go through it. Okay, so a bee hotel is basically a collection of hollow cavities our above ground nesting bees are going to build nests in. These are our mason bees and our cutting bees. Um, you'll want to place them in sort of sort of a, a sunny location with maybe a roof for rain um, and uh, have a, a collection of, of, of blocks. But the, the plus side, as I mentioned, is that they bring this bee ecology so much closer to home. I think the downside is that they're often thought of as like the one-stop way of saving bee populations. And that's, there's actually no data to support that. Um, oftentimes these bee hotels are not occupied by the native bees interested in. Um, many exotic bees will nest in these hotels and many wasps, in, uh, exotic wasps will use these hotels as well. Not the social kind, but um, they're not always occupied by who we intend. Um, the other thing is that if they're not kept clean um, from year to year, they can actually harbor pathogens and parasites. And so just like any hotel or motel that doesn't get cleaned regularly, it becomes not a great place to, to raise, you know, to, to, to live and to hang out. Unfortunately, bees have a hard time distinguishing between any cavity and a cavity that's not suitable. And so what we find is that bees will build their nests in these unclean cavities but those nests will die. And so in order to be a good manager of a hotel, you should place it in an area with good airflow to discourage mold from building up, that roof to divert rain, um, and then don't purchase them from big box stores. Um, big box stores like Home Depot um, often have the, the tubes that are glued in and they're often way too short for a bee to build a success nest. The cavities, you should clean them out with a long Q-tip. You can just tape it onto a piece of spaghetti and just swab in and out and then wash it clean with water uh, in the summer um, to make sure that there's no buildup of pathogens. And so under this framework, I recommending, recommend having two sets of bee hotels, one that you deploy in year one that gets occupied. It, bees emerge from it the following spring. You take that inside and you clean it and you've deployed a new clean bee hotel out. And so you're constantly making sure there's a clean uh, domicile for these bees to res reside in. Um, and so that's, that's, those are my recommendations for how you keep a good bee hotel. Thank um, you for all those instructions. That is definitely a lot more work than just putting something out once. And also you could just not clean up your yards in the fall and give the same support or better. It seems like that would be um, a so low... Yeah, please show us though. Yes. So the other way you can create a bit more natural bee hotel is to leave stems standing in your yard. Uh, stems, uh, many of them are naturally hollow. And so you can just think of it as like sort of like a vertical bee hotel that plants make for you. The great part about stems is that they naturally degrade over time. So you don't need to worry about constantly cleaning out your stems. If after three years, those stems break down, you're good. You're not providing a an infected resident for the bees. The key is to knowing when you have to clean up your garden in order to make this work. So year one, the plant is going to grow the stems. Those stems are gonna be green and you're gonna cut them to maybe 12 inches in December or March. You're going to grow things like milkweed or monarda or joe pie weed, all of which have hollow stems. And you're going to cut those stems to that at least about 12 inches. Those stems are in a year, and the bees are going to build nests in those hollow stems. They may build nests, but they also may just hang out during a rainstorm. I've seen male bees just sitting inside nests, which is also shelter, also habitat, um, and also a really great way of, of attracting bees to your yard. Those nests now have been a full year standing until they emerge the following summer. So year one, the plant grew, there were no bees inside the nest. Year two, the cut stem have active nests. And then year three, the bees emerge from those cut stems. If at any point during this cycle, you've cut down the stems, 
the, the, you're not actually providing habitat for bees. I think it's really easy to get people to cut stems and leave for at least one winter. And it's really hard to get people to say, oh, I'm going to leave those stems a full extra year. If you're going out and you're off and you're like, oh my goodness, there's so many brown things. I want to clean it up. Just resist the urge to clean up your garden. One thing that you can do to, you can rope it off to remind yourself not to clean that area. You could do a test where you leave half of your garden standing, half of your garden not standing. Um, if you're worried about the brown stems showing, I've found that many plants grow to a height greater than a foot and the new vegetation conceals the old vegetation. And so you don't even know that there's dead stems standing there. The bees can find it though. So don't worry about vegetation concealing that nest entrance. I also get questions about like, can I just cut the stems and lie around? Well, no, because that stem is now going to be susceptible to mo moisture and mold and that stem is going to rot with the bees inside. So if you want to cut your stems and place them somewhere else, you could cut them and bundle them up. That's sort of like a, a natural bee hotel. You could also take the stems and put them in the ground elsewhere, sort of like a standing array. Um, if you want to keep one part of your garden free of bees and others not. I suspect that the first time you see a bee standing, living in a stem in your garden, like you'll be overcome with excitement as I was. And you'll be like, oh my goodness, how could I ever cut a stem again uh, if this is a home for a bee? Thanks for all those suggestions. I think it's around this time of year where things are starting to get going, but they're not big yet, that people who are otherwise patient with the brown stuff start to get really antsy to clip Back. I know I've had that impulse myself, and I think that you've given us a bunch of really helpful suggestions on ways to um, be patient, um, get excited, or um, relocate something. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, let's see, I wanted to, um, I guess there's a couple of questions about the um, parasitic relationship between some of these predators you talked about and um, and the bees. And um, one person was asking about whether, um, I guess, if any of these um, parasitic um, insects you've asked about only consume one of the host eggs or larvae or whether they're able to get, I guess, between different cells. Um, the example of us in the video, which was awesome to watch. I really enjoyed that. Um, was really depositing it between two barriers on both sides in that cell. So that's its one source of food and there's going to be normal bees developing on both other sides of it, right? Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, um, <clears throat> um, I think it varies a little bit. So I think many of the mechanisms that predators have or getting their eggs inside of bees' nests um, often are sort of hinge on getting it inside one brood cell. It is like, it is a success if that happens. Like the blister beetle I described, it's a huge game of chance. And if it can get inside one brood cell, that's amazing. Um, one thing that I've, I've found through my research is that the way those blister beetles get inside the bees' nests, right, they're hitchhiking on the back of the female bee. So a female bee that has beetle larvae on her back for multiple days, and is building multiple cells during that time, she's going to deposit a beetle larva <laughs> unintentionally in every one of those cells. And so what I find is that there are nests that are completely free of parasites, and then there's nests that are almost completely parasitized. Um, and so that's just a feature of, of that biology. Right. Um, from the wasp perspective, um, it, could, it, would, it would never be advantageous to parasitize that open cell because they'll come back and detect that it had been parasitized. And so it can't parasitize the entire nest. Also, it's limited by how long its ovipositor is. If it can't reach the way back, it can't parasitize that, that, that nest all the way back there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna leave it there. Thanks. I was gonna ask you something that kind of goes right after that in a way. Um, so um, with some other parasitic insects, and their hosts. Huh. Um, sometimes the host insects have, um, like, let's say there's a parasitic wasp egg and a caterpillar. Some species are able to do encapsulation to prevent themselves. Like, there's a way to detect that it's happened in the host. Um, I'm thinking of it sort of as an analogy. Is there nothing that the that the female bee laying her eggs and and closing the cells? Is there no way for her to detect 
physical or a chemical signature behind of a tampered cell, or is the ovipositor so um, stealthy that, um, that it's able to deposit that one egg and then be gone with no trace? That's, that's a, a phenomenal question. I, I don't know. I don't know of a case um, where a bee has successfully like detected um, a parasitism event and then like destroyed the cell. Um, I would not put it past bees to evolve a strategy to do that. Um, one, one strategy that at least the cuckoo bees have is they'll actually go in and parasitize completed cells. And so a cell that a female is not paying attention to anymore, um, the cellophane bees that build their brood cells out of that saliva, uh, that saliva polymerizes into sort of a waterproof lining. Um, and their cuckoo bees actually are able to slit open the cellophane, lay an egg inside, and then reseal it. And so a female bee is not going to go back in there because she thinks she's finished the cell. Um, and that's one way that those cuckoo bees have sort of out, outsmarted the host bees. Um, as you're describing, there's like always like this arms race, like developing newer and newer ways of outsmarting your predators. That's why it doesn't wouldn't surprise me if bees have a way of doing it. I don't have an example off the top of my head. I mean, it gets to like what you were saying before about there's so much that we don't know about what's happening inside these uh, plant stems or underground. And um, I'm so glad that you're you're um, studying this to learn more. That's it is um, these secret lives are fascinating. Um, Related to that, I mean, you've been talking about how we bring um, joy and closeness, uh, adults and also children. And um, as a parent and um, someone who works with kids in the school, trying to uh, learn more about the world outside, and I'm sure many of our other listeners have a similar experience, like what suggestions do you have for how to help uh, kids especially be able to, to sit quietly in the ways that you need to be able to really observe bees to develop that comfort that you're, you know, make such a difference with how we feel about them. Like, are there certain times of day or um, locations where you feel like um, facilitate observation? Or do you have to sit quietly like a birder all day long to achieve this? That's a wonderful question. And thank you for asking it. Um, in my experience, kids are some of the most astute observers I've ever worked with. They ask the most obvious questions that scientists don't have the answer to. They're like, well, why wouldn't we know this? And I'm like, oh, we don't. Um, one activity that I love um, doing is trying to engage everyone's, all the senses. And so, you know, what do you hear? What do you, what do you see? What do you smell? Um, what would this look like from a bee's perspective? And what, how do you engage with the flowers? Like buzz pollination is like a great sensory activity. Like, can you hear the bee buzzing? Um, why, you know, talking about do flowers smell and if, can the kids smell it? Um, an activity that can foster close observation um, is uh, promoted by this nature journal. His name's John Muir Laws. And it's basically, uh, what do I notice? Uh, what do I wonder and what am I reminded of? And yeah. if you ask yourself those three questions, um, it forces you to like slow down and then also relate it back to your own life. And so maybe a kid will now think of this flower like a favorite dessert um, because it smells a certain way or it looks a certain way. Um, and this is not just for kids. Like I do this with my college you know, undergrad students. Um, and the other activity that I love, it's called 20 questions. And it's literally just trying to ask 20 questions about what you're seeing. And it can be, you know, why is the sky blue? Why is the leaf green? And soon you start running out of like really obvious things to ask questions about. And you start focusing on what's directly in front of you. And so like, you know, maybe you say, why is there a ladybug there? Where is that ladybug going? Where was that ladybug coming from? What is this in, it's like approaching this ladybug? Um, is the ladybug tired? You know, all, you can ask all sorts of questions. And importantly, it, there's like no wrong way to do it. The only wrong way to do it is like not doing it. Um, and I think sort of making nature observation um, as personal as possible and as sort of, you know, you can do it in whatever way you want and you can form your own relationship with nature is like so, so critical to engaging kids at a young age. Thanks. Uh, I love, I, I haven't 
thought about 20 questions in that way. I love that um, suggestion. Um, let's see, we're, we're running out of time. There are so many questions. Do you have do you have an activity you like doing? I'm just curious. Uh, uh, well, actually, well, so we have this big backyard program in Lexington Public Schools, which we actually have adopted the, I, I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of approach there as well. And um, we do a lot of <clears throat> those activities. Um, one of the challenges is, you know, like when the constraint of what the seasonality of their, their walks is and what floral resources are available yet in early spring when a lot of them are up in the trees. Um, and so I think this is maybe, I, I would encourage people to keep doing it all summer, even when we're not in school, when there's a lot more flowers closer to the ground. Um, but I did wanna ask you, um, I guess one final question, um, because a lot of the people tuning in tonight are probably people who are interested in, you know, um, not just changing their yard cleanup practices, but also they've been enthusiastically planting native plants around. And I was struck by what you were saying with the ironweed and how you know this species appeared and you don't know how far away the next patch of ironweed was. And we do have this rather patchy landscape of uh, here in Lexington of forest and developed land and the developed land is some of it is beautiful gardens and some of it's monoculture and some of it's paved and it's all kinds of things. But we do have a very you know, patchy resources and people are adding little bits of um, flowers here and, and there all over. Um, like what, what do we know about um, how bees find the flowers that they're gonna come visit um, and how, how far, what's the scale at which, I know they all like different sizes travel different distances, but what's kind of a range of which um, the bees are traveling to locate these patches? Um, another great question, another area like rice, for more research. Uh, and some of the research I've done is focused on the distances that bee bees move to find flowers. Um, so the first question is like, how do bees locate flowers? Um, from a distance, it's going to be a combination of visual and olfactory cues. So bees have very good senses of smell. Um, they smell through their antennae. Um, and especially specialist bees that have evolved a relationship with a particular plant uh, have been shown to be four times as sensitive to their host plant as sort of a generalist bee. And so bees are very sensitive, uh, often smelling plants that are imperceptible, have imperceptible odors to us, like squash, which doesn't smell fragrant, um, must smell so intensely to a squash bee, and the same with ironweed. And so if an ironweed bee is in the area, who knows how little amount of flower needs to be there for that bee to find it. In terms of how far bees forage, so, so bees build nests in fixed locations, right? And they go out from that nest to find flowers. Um, and when they find a new patch of flowers, they're not going to like build another nest near there, right? They're going to find those flowers and then bring the resources back. And when they're doing those sort that sort of foraging, um, small bees will forage maybe about a quarter or a third of a mile. So, you know, a few hundred meters uh, to find those flowers. Um, but the other question is like when they're dispersing, like when they're building a new nest and like flying somewhere else to do that. And so my research suggests that bees will a lot, lot farther to build a second nest uh, than they would to just forage. And so bees like building nests near, you know, good patches of flowers, and then they'll fly a considerable distance to find that next suitable habitat. And so that's one thing that I think really encourages me to continue planting for bees is that if I can provide nesting resources in my yard, I could ostensibly have a bee complete its entire life cycle in my garden and have it only fly like a few, a few meters to find flowers. Um, one of the things that I love doing with my students is we paint bees on their backs, different colors, and we find where their nests are and we see how far they forage. And there's a bee on one side of our courtyard that's nesting in a bare patch of dirt. And then it flies across the courtyard to the purple cone flower to get some food and then we see it fly back. You don't even need to like follow it. You just like see it go back and drops in. Um, and so by doing that, we make these individuals and we're able to track their life cycles. Um, anyway, long story short, there's a lot we have to learn about how bees move through the landscape. I think the next 20 years with like smaller and smaller radio chips are going to be really, really exciting for unpacking this black box of bee movement. And I will say, I think bees also get around a lot better than we might currently appreciate. I think there's a lot of movement uh, that bees can do you know, higher up in the atmosphere, movements at like, distances that we can't even track. But for example, there's a bee called the ivy bee in Europe. 
and it repeatedly colonized Europe across the English Channel, a distance of 80 miles, right? Like there's no land in between. It had to fly that far. And so is that anomaly? Do many bees make movements that far? Is like a kilometer just an absurdly underestimate of how far bees fly? We don't know. I, I think I can't think of a better way to wrap up. I could be asking you questions for the rest of the night, but um, you have shared so many, um, so many interesting stories and um, answered so many questions. Uh, I have really enjoyed this talk. I'm sure everyone else has. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah, thanks uh, so much. It's been a great evening. And um, on that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Matt from the library. Yeah, I uh, just want to also say thank you, Sarah, Charlie, and and uh, Nick for, have for a little uh, bit of sound trial. Oh, uh, yeah, so my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully it's better now. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah and Charlie, for putting this together, and Nick for providing your wealth of knowledge with everyone. Um, this event was uh, recorded and will be on the library's YouTube channel in the next coming days, and you'll receive a recap email. But just wanted to say thank you again so much. And uh, that's, that's it. So have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Charlie.